Hello, friends. This is your lesson on social and cognitive learning. This is a longer lesson, and it has a lot of research and experiment stories in it. So keep that in mind as we're moving through it. We're going to start off with biopsychosocial influences on learning. So break that down real fast before we jump right in. Bio, living, psycho, and social. We've got three different things we're talking about, right? So our learning results not only from environmental experiences, but also from cognitive and biological influences, which is known as the biopsychosocial approach. We definitely talked about this in unit one. And as I said in unit one, we're touching base on all of the different approaches that we talked about throughout this year. So let's break it down. Biological influences are genetic predispositions, unconditioned responses, adaptive responses, and neural mirroring, which we will go into in this lesson. Psychological influences. What are your previous experiences? What are, what's the predictability of associations? Generalization, discrimination, expectations. And remember from last lesson, discrimination does not mean discrimination in the sense that we know it. It just means telling the difference between two things. Social and cultural influences, um, so culturally learned preferences, motivation affected by the presence of others, and modeling. So jumping into some key people in this lesson, we'll start with John Garcia. He was among those who challenged the prevailing idea that all associations can be learned equally well. So all associations can be learned equally well. In order to test that, the experiments that were conducted were by John Garcia and Robert Kohling, exposed a group of rats to a particular taste, sight, or sound, and later also to radiation or drugs that led to nausea and vomiting. What were two findings in this study? First, even if, a sick, even if sickened as late as several hours after tasting a particular novel flavor, the rats thereafter avoided that flavor. Second, the sickened rats developed conditioned aversions to taste, but not to sights or sounds. This made adaptive sense. For rats, the easiest way to identify tainted food is to taste it. If sickened after sampling a new food, they thereafter avoid it. This is called taste aversion avoiding something based on how it tastes as it is going to impact you negatively or make you sick. So if you became violently ill after eating oysters, you would probably have a hard time eating them again. Their smell and taste would have become a conditioned stimulus for nausea. This learning occurs readily because our biology prepares us to learn taste aversions to toxic foods. Naturally adaptive behaviors are easy to condition. So another example, pigeons can easily be conditioned to flap their wings to avoid being shocked and to peck to obtain food. Fleeing with their wings and eating with their beaks are natural pigeon behaviors. However, pigeons would have a hard time learning to peck to avoid a shock or to flap their wings to obtain food. What is instinctive drift? drift? So instinctive drift is the tendency of learned behavior to gradually revert to biologically predisposed patterns. For example, pigs conditioned to pick up large wooden dollars and deposit them in a piggy bank began to drift back to their natural ways. They dropped the coin, pushed it with their snouts as pigs are prone to do, picked it up again, and then repeated the sequence, delaying their food reinforcement because they're biologically predisposed to use their snouts. How do cognitive processes affect classical conditioning? So in their dismissal of mentalistic concepts such as consciousness, Pavlov and Watson from last lesson underestimated the importance of the effects of cognitive processes, thoughts, perceptions, expectations. And this was actually two lessons ago on classical conditioning. So they underestimated the importance of the effects of cognitive processes. So the thoughts, perceptions, and expectations. What did Rescorla and Wagner show? 
Robert Rescorla and Alan Wagner showed that an animal can learn the predictability of an event. The more predictable the association, the stronger the conditioned response. It's as if the animal learns an expectancy and awareness of how likely it is that the unconditioned stimulus will occur. So we're learning an expectancy and an awareness. How are associations limited in their influence on attitudes? People, people receiving therapy for alcohol use disorder may be given alcohol spiked with a nauseating drug. Will they then associate alcohol with sickness? If classical conditioning were merely a matter of stamping in a stimulus associations, we might hope so, and to some extent this does occur. So, our cognitions matter? Knowing that the nausea is induced by the drug, not the alcohol, often weakens the association between drinking alcohol and feeling sick, which then reduces the treatment's effectiveness. So, even in classical conditioning, it is, especially with humans, not simply the conditioned stimulus, unconditioned stimulus association, but also the thought that counts. How do cognitive processes affect operant conditioning? In their dismissal of mentalistic concepts such as consciousness, Pavlov and Watson underestimated the importance of the effects of cognitive processes, thoughts, perceptions, and expectations. And if you're wondering if this slide is just like the one a few slides ago, you are exactly right, except for the title. The title is How Do Cognitive Processes Affect Operant Conditioning? Whereas the last one was, how do they affect classical conditioning? And as you can see, exactly the same. Pavlov and Watson did not consider the important effects of cognitive processes. That's the important thing that, that I'm trying to really help you understand, that thoughts, perceptions, and expectations are actually really important in classical and operant conditioning and learning. So what's a cognitive map? A mental representation of the layout of one's environment. So for example, after exploring a maze, rat, rats act as if they have learned a cognitive map of it. So bathroom, sure, it's down the hall to the left. Jog right, left, another left, straight, past two more lefts, then right, and it's at the end of the third corridor on your right. That's a cognitive map. If you've ever given directions, you have a cognitive map of something. What is latent learning? Learning that occurs but is not apparent until there's an incentive to demonstrate it. How did Tolman and Honzik research latent learning? In a classic experiment, rats in one group repeatedly explored a maze, always with a food reward at the end. Rats in another group explored the maze with no food reward. But once given a food reward at the end, Rats in the second group thereafter ran the maze as quickly as the always rewarded rats did. Latent learning involves cognition. So the point to remember, there is more to learning than associated a response than associating a response with a consequence. There is also cognition. What is insight learning? A sudden realization of a problem solution contrasts with strategy-based solutions. So think of this. 10-year-old Johnny Appleton's insight solved a problem that had stumped construction workers. How to rescue a young robin from a narrow 30-inch deep hole in a cement block wall. Johnny's solution? Slowly pour in sand, giving the bird enough time to keep its feet on top of the constantly rising pile. What is the difference between ex extrinsic and intrinsic motivation to learn? We talk about this all the time in Montessori. Extrinsic motivation is a desire to perform a behavior, to receive promised rewards, or avoid threatened punishment. We do not operate on extrinsic motivation in Montessori. Instead, we operate on intrinsic motivation, a desire to perform a behavior effectively for its own sake. So learning in order to learn not to receive a grade. Now we know that that's not always the case and that a lot of you are like, oh, but I really want to just get this done so I can get the grade. The goal is that in life you practice intrinsic motivation so that you end up doing things 
that you love, really, and that you're doing it to perform a behavior that is just solely doing it to do that thing, not to get something out of it. So our examples of extrinsic and intrinsic motivation are these. Extrinsic, are you feeling pressured to finish your homework before a deadline? Are you worried about your grade? Are you eager for college credit by doing well on the AP exam? If yes, then you are extrinsically motivated. Intrinsic motivation, are you also finding the material interesting? If there were no grade at stake, might you be curious enough to want to learn the material for its own sake? If yes, intrinsic motivation fuels your efforts. And there aren't any right or wrong answers to these. It's just an, a reflection for you to know where you are with these. And of course, you're not going to be intrinsically motivated the same with all subjects. Obviously, you're going to be more intrinsically motivated with the things that you find interesting and that you're passionate about. How does the cognitive perspective show us the limits of rewards? So people promising a reward for a task they already enjoy can backfire. This is called the overjustification effect. Excessive rewards can destroy intrinsic motivation, the desire to perform a behavior effectively for its own sake. AP exam tip. So although you didn't read about the overjustification effect in your text, it's likely that it'll appear on the AP exam. The overjustification effect occurs when an, un when an expected external incentive, such as money or prizes, decreases a person's intrinsic motivation to perform a task. Let's look at the research on how cognition impacts extrinsic motivation. In experiments, children have been promised a payoff for playing with an interesting puzzle or toy. Later, they played with the toy less than did the unpaid children. Likewise, rewarding children with toys or candy for reading diminishes the time they spend reading. That's why we don't do treats and prizes in the classroom. It does not work long term. It might work at first, but long term it does not work and you will not learn better. What are the biological and cognitive influences on opera and classical conditioning? So, we're going to compare. Biological first to, with classical and operant. So with classical conditioning, the biological influences are the natural predispositions that constrain what stimuli and responses can easily be associated. So really natural predispositions. With operant conditioning, organisms most easily learn behaviors similar to their natural behaviors. Unnatural behaviors instinctively drift back toward natural ones. So that's review, we've already gone over that. So I just wanna point out there's nothing new here, we're just tying it all together. With cognitive influences, with classical conditioning, organisms develop an expectation that the conditioned stimulus signals the arrival of the unconditioned stimulus. So again, the expectation. With operant conditioning, organisms develop an expectation that a response will be reinforced or punished. They also exhibit latent learning without reinforcement. And what two ways do people learn to cope with personal problems? There's problem-focused coping and emotion-focused coping. With problem-focused coping, that's attempting to alleviate stress directly by changing the stressor or the way we interact with that stressor. So going right into the source and changing it. With emotion-focused coping, we're attempting to alleviate stress by avoiding or ignoring a stressor and attending to emotional needs related to our stress reaction. So I like to think of these two things as going directly through or going around. With problem-focused coping, you're going directly through and getting right to the meat of the issue. And with emotion-focused coping, kind of skirting the issue and going around it. What is personal control? So our sense of impacting and directing our environment rather than feeling helpless. What is learned helplessness? The, helpless, the hopelessness, resignation, an animal or person acquires when unable to avoid repeated aversive events. So look at the diagram. There's an uncontrollable bad event. Then there's a feeling of perceived lack of control. And then there's generalized helpless behavior. 
as a result of the perceived lack of control, and that's a repeated cycle. What research has been conducted on learned helplessness? In experiments, dogs were strapped in a harness and given repeated shocks with no opportunity to avoid them. Later, when placed in another situation where they could escape the punishment by simply, simply leaping a hurdle, the dogs displayed learned helplessness. They cowered as if without hope. Other dogs that had been able to escape the first shocks reacted differently. They had learned they were in control and easily escaped the shocks in the new situation. What does perceived loss of control predict, or why does perceived loss of control predict health problems? When rats cannot control shock, or when humans or other primates feel unable to control their environment, stress hormone levels rise, blood pressure increases, and immune responses drop. That's all from a lack of perceived control, which is crazy. So this is something that's a perception, a perceived lack of control. That is actually controllable, the lack of perceived control, which is interesting. So let's look at the research on it. Captive animals experience more stress and are more vulnerable to disease than their wild counterparts. The greater a nurse's workload, the higher level their cortisol level and blood pressure, but only among nurses who reported little control over their environment. The crowding in high density neighborhoods, prisons and college and university dorms is another source of diminished feelings of control and of elevated levels of stress hormones and blood pressure. So let's look at Julian Rotter's loci of control, an external locus of control versus internal locus of control. The perception that chance or outside forces beyond our personal direction determine our fate. So that means you do not, that if you have that perception, if you view life through an external locus of control, then you perceive life as being out of your control. You perceive it as being in the control of chance or outside forces. Whereas an internal locus of control, that's the perception that we direct and create our own fate, where you choose how you react to things, you choose what you want to do in life, you make choices. Yes, life is gonna come at you and things are going to happen, but regardless, you make choices of how to respond next. What has research shown about internal locus of control? Internals have achieved more in school and work, acted more independently, enjoyed better health, and felt less depressed than did the externals. When you're always blaming it on something else, that leads to feelings of hopelessness and help learned helplessness. People with an internal locus of control at age 10 exhibited less obesity, lower blood pressure, and less distress at age 30. Compared with non-leaders, military and business leaders have lower than average levels of stress hormones and report less anxiety thanks to their greater sense of control. And I don't want you to freak out about this. If you are like, oh my gosh, I, I have an external locus of control, that's okay. It's just a place to start noticing where can you have more of an internal loci of control or internal locus of control. What is self-control? Well, the ability to control impulses and delay short-term gratification for long-term rewards. A number of performing artists make their living as very convincing human statues, as does this actress performing the Royal Mile in Edinburgh, Scotland. Why is self-control important? Self-control predicts good health, higher income, and better school performance. In studies of American, Asian, and New Zealander children, self-control out outdid intelligence test scores in predicting future academic and life success. How can our self-control be depleted? Self-control varies over time. Like a muscle, it tends to weaken after use, recover after rest, and grow stronger with exercise. In one famous experiment, hungry people who had spent some of their willpower resisting the temptation to eat chocolate chip cookies 
then abandoned a tedious task sooner than did others. All right, moving on to the last chunk of our lesson. What is observational learning? Higher animals, especially humans, learn without direct experience by watching and imitating others. We learn our native languages and various other specific behaviors by observing and imitating others, which is a process called modeling. For instance, a child who sees his sister burn her fingers on a hot stove learns not to touch the stove. Who is Albert Bandura? Albert Bandura, shown here receiving a 2016 U.S. National Medal of Science from President Obama, is the pioneering researcher of observational learning. What did his research conduct? He conducted the Bobo Doll study. So Bandura, Bobo Doll, Bandura, Bobo Doll, Bandura, Bobo Doll. What was the research design? A preschool child works on a drawing. An adult in another part of the room builds with tinker toys. As the child watches, the adult gets up and for nearly 10 minutes, pounds, kicks, and throws around the room a large inflated Bobo doll. Bobo doll yelling, sock him in the nose, hit him down, kick him. What happens next? The child is taken to another room filled with appealing toys. Soon the experimenter returns and tells the child She's decided to save these good toys for the other children. She takes the now frustrated child to a third room containing a few dolls, including a Bobo doll. Left alone, what does a child do? Well, compared with children not exposed to the adult model, those who, those who viewed the model's aggressive actions were more likely to lash out at the doll. Observing the aggressive outbursts apparently lowered their inhibitions. But something more was also at work, for the children imitated the very acts they had observed and used the very words they had heard. What's the takeaway? Well, by watching models, we experience vicarious reinforcement or vicarious punishment, and we learn to anticipate a behavior's consequences in situations like those we're observing. We're especially likely to learn from people we perceive as similar to ourselves, as successful or as admirable. So we learn by observation, but how? Well, the thing I talked about in the very beginning of the lesson called mirror neurons. These are frontal lobe neurons that some scientists believe fire when we perform certain actions or observe another's actions. The brain's mirroring of another's action may enable imitation and empathy. How is imitation adaptive? In one 27-year analysis of 73,790 humpback whale observations, a single whale in 1980 whacked the water to drive fish, crayfish into a clump. In the years since, this lobtail technique spread among other whales. Researchers trained groups of verve monkeys, monkeys to prefer either blue or pink corn by soaking one color in a disgusting tasting solution. Four to six months later, after a new generation of monkeys was born, the adults stuck with whatever color they had learned to prefer, and on observing them, so did all but one of the 27 infant monkeys. Humans are natural imitators too. By eight to 16 months, infants imitate various novel gestures. By 12 months, they look where an adult is looking. And by 14 months, children imitate acts modeled on TV, which is kind of scary. Do we imitate emotions as well? Well, yeah, we find ourselves yawning when others yawn, smiling when others smile, laughing when others laugh, observing others' postures, faces, voices, and writing styles. We unconsciously synchronize our own to theirs which helps us feel what they are feeling, which is why it's really, really important for me as a teacher to check myself, to check what am I projecting before you come into this classroom? What am I projecting and how is what I'm projecting going to be picked up by you? Because what I'm projecting just by you coming in, you can pick up on it. So if I had a bad morning and you come in, I might share that with you. And, and that's something that I can impact the rest of your day by how you imitate my emotions. Imitation also helps us gain friends, leading us to mimic those we like.
So can we feel others' pain? Brain activity related to actual pain on the left is mirrored in the brain of an observing loved one on the right. Empathy in the brain shows up in emotional brain areas, but not in the somatosensory cortex, which receives the physical pain input. So pro-social modeling is positive, constructive, helpful behavior. People who exemplify nonviolent, helpful behavior can also prompt similar behavior in others. Watching others help pick up spilled books or coins or viewing positively themed television programming can produce positive help helping behaviors in others. This girl is learning orphan nursing skills as well as compassion by observing her mentor in the Humane Society program. Antisocial modeling is observational learning may also have antisocial effects. This helps us understand why abusive parents might have aggressive children. TV shows, movies, and online videos are sources of observational learning. During their first 18 years, most children in developed countries spend more time watching TV than they spend in school. The average teen watches more than four hours a day. The average adult, three hours. People, get outside. Put your phones down. Connect with other people. Connect with outdoors. Connect in some way with something other than something that's fake, which is a TV. How violent is TV programming? Between 1998 and 2006, primetime violence on TV reportedly increased 75%. An analysis of more than 3,000 network and cable programs aired during one closely studied year revealed that nearly 6 in 10 featured violence and 74% of the violence went unpunished, which sent the message that violence is okay. What is depicted in violent programming? 58% of violent shows did not depict the, violent, the victim's pain. Nearly half of the incidents involved justified violence and nearly half involved an attractive perpetrator. What prompts the violence viewing effect? Experimental studies have found that media violence viewing can cause aggression. <clears throat> so, watching cartoons, sevenfold increase in violent play, limited exposure to violent programs, reduced aggressive behavior. There is a definite cause and effect. How does desensitization impact violent behavior? Viewers become progressively less bothered by the violence. Compared to a control group, subjects express less sympathy for domestic violence victims and rated victims' injuries as less severe. So prolonged exposure to violence is going to equal viewers are later indifferent or desensitized to violence on TV or in real life. So the research shows the APA, the American Psychological Association Task Force on Violent Media in 2015, found that the research demonstrates a consistent relation between violent video game use and increases in aggressive behavior, aggressive cognitions, aggressive affect, and decreases in pro-social behavior, empathy, and sensitivity to aggression. Last, how does exposure to media violence impact children? The American Academy of Pediatrics has advised pediatricians that media violence can contribute to aggressive behavior, desensitization to violence, nightmares, and a fear of being harmed.